Specialty Story Session Number 108. Whether you are a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you'll want to practice. This podcast will tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. Welcome to Specialty Stories. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, and I'm excited to bring another physician on the podcast to talk about his specialty. Today, we're going to talk to Dr. Jason Shapiro, a pediatric gastroenterologist at Brown. And we're going to talk all about pediatric gastroenterology, what got Dr. Shapiro involved and interested in PDGI, and so much more. So stay tuned for that. We're going to jump in and discuss really what got Dr. Shapiro interested in PDGI to begin with. That was probably the first month of my intern year. Um, I did my residency here at uh, at Brown at Hasbro Children's Hospital. And uh, one of the first attendings I worked with on the floors was a a guy by the name of Neil Oleiko, who's our division chief currently uh, here in PDGI. And he kind of took me under his wing, got me really interested in GI. that year, I attended one of our one of the national PDGI conferences, and I was kind of hooked. After that, I, I spent uh, I spent the plane ride home, essentially preparing my personal statement, and um, <laughs> I was pretty much immediately sold on uh, on PDGI. <laughs> what was it about uh, what you were exposed to that that had you hooked? So I think it was kind of the how diverse the field is. So. When I was, and I think this, you might get to this later, but when I was in med school, I really wanted something hands-on. And so meaning like, you know, some like initially thought surgery, thought neurosurgery, kind of ended up going to pediatrics because that was really my passion. And I loved uh, taking care of kids and interacting with kids. But when I started residency, I was kind of like, all right, well, what do I want to do with this? Like, I don't really think I want to do primary care. I still really am interested in a procedure-based specialty. And GI kind of checked all the right boxes for me. We get to do a lot of procedures. The pathology is really interesting. You get good longitudinal follow-up with your patients and families. And then another thing that I became really passionate about is research and the research aspect of things within um, PDGI, especially my specialty, which is uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, It's just fascinating. You know, there's a lot going on in terms of um, immunology, microbiome, medication, and optimizing medication effects. For me, it was just there was so much opportunity. It was really fascinating. It just, it just was a perfect fit for me. What traits do you think lead to someone being a good PDGI doc? Imagine the same traits that make anybody a good doc in general. I think really loving patient care, truly caring about your patients and families and wanting to you know, give them good, good outcomes and maintain a good quality of life. I mean, my, uh, most of my clinical time, not all, but most of my clinical time is with kids with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So these are pretty impactful conditions. And, you know, you want to kind of have them have as minimal effect on a child's day-to-day life as possible. And so to really be able to understand that, you know, you need to be empathetic, you need to be compassionate, you got to be a hard worker. I mean, this, this, you know, like any field, you know, it's a lot of hours, it's a lot of time. But I think at the end of the day, you just really have to care. Yeah. As a PDGI doc, uh, you said you specialize mostly in IBD. What types of patients are you seeing? What ages are you seeing those those patients coming to you? So it it can present at any age, really. Um, I feel like most kids present either early adolescence, but there's been a huge uptick in what we we call very early onset IBD, where you're seeing kids less than five come in with these diseases. And so that's a whole you got to, you know, approach them very differently. So I'd say mostly, you know, new diagnoses are early teens, but it it can be, it can really run the spectrum. So just today, right now, I I can tell you, I just got back from clinic. I saw an eight-year-old, I saw a 12-year-old, I saw a 15-year-old, all with very different um, phenotypes of Crohn's disease, but diagnosed at different ages. So it's, it's really pretty variable. What else, uh, as a PDGI doc, what else are you seeing? So our bread and butter for PDGI is infants with gastroesophageal reflux. Um, We see a lot of milk protein allergy in infants. 
probably one of the more common things you'll see in day-to-day clinic is, you know, kids with constipation. That's a big one. We also see kids with celiac disease. We're seeing a huge increase in an allergic condition called eosinophilic esophagitis. So that's something that we all see pretty regularly. And then functional abdominal pain. So kids that have belly pain, whether it's related to stress or anxiety, you know, you kind of have to go through the motions and do, you know, some degree of a workup to make sure you're not missing anything. But, you know, a lot of our kids have belly aches and, you know, there's nothing organically wrong with them. They just, you know, have, we say, you know, hypersensitive to pain or to nerves. And we're lucky here at, at Brown, we have a team of GI psychologists that work with us that are really helpful in um, helping us co-manage some of those more complicated kids. Yeah. You talked about kind of the workup there a little bit. What percentage of the patients do you think are coming to you with a diagnosis and, and you're there for definitive treatment versus coming to you for that diagnosis? That's a good question. No, most of the kids, so most of the referrals we get are kind of a, a blank canvas. So they've had belly pain, they've had weight loss, um, vomiting, diarrhea, blood in the stools. For the, the majority of our new patient referrals from a general pediatrician have not had too extensive of a workup just yet. Every now and then some of the pediatricians have done um, you know, some screening labs where there's been concerns for you know, a normal inflammatory markers or maybe they're having anemia. Um, but most of, the, most of the kids that we see, you know, other than second opinions and stuff, um, are, are, you know, need to be worked up and you're really doing the, the detective work and try, trying to figure out what's going on, deciding as a GI doc, do they need an endoscopy? Do they need a colonoscopy? Do they need both? What other kinds of imaging studies might they need? What other kind of lab tests might they need? So there is, there is a fair degree of, um, of a diagnostic workup that needs to be done. And, you know, that can be very fulfilling um, and intellectually stimulating as yeah. well. What percentage of patients do you think you're doing procedures on? Not a huge amount. You know, I, I think, you know, there's different ways to practice and, you know, different um, practice models. We are definitely, you know, in my group, um, we're not a place where we would scope every single kid. You know, you want really good objective data to lead you towards whether or not a kid needs to have an endoscopy or a colonoscopy. And you really want to have an index of suspicion of a certain condition or disease before going ahead. I mean, these procedures are, you know, relatively safe um, and not non-invasive, but they all our kids are done under general anesthesia. Um, so, you know, it, it's something that you don't want to just do without having a good reason to do it. So percentage, that's a good question. I'd say of the num- total number of kids we see in clinic, I'd probably say less than 10%, but I, I could be wrong. I'd have to do the math. Yeah. And and just getting a ballpark number, I think, is important because yeah. just like if students who are interested in emergency medicine and they think 90% of the, the patients they see are trauma and gunshot wounds, I, I think yeah, a lot of people yeah, exactly. who, who think GI think, oh, I'm going to be scoping all day long and, and doing procedures all day long. And yet that's just that's not... A, a typical caseload. It's not. I think in having said that, so my typical week, I do I do endoscopies every every week. Uh, Wednesday is my day, and mm. we the way our practice works is we all um, we share endos, endo, endoscopy time. So we scope each other's patients. So I my I have a full day every Wednesday. Um, so we're never at at a loss for the patients that we scope. But you know, most of the kids you go through their charts, there's a good reason to do it. So if you do, for the students out there that are interested in GI, there's definitely a hands-on approach. When we're on call, we're doing probably more procedures a lot of times than we'd like. So um, there's no lack of procedures, but there is a nuance of wanting to know, you know, if you see a new patient in clinic, do they truly need to have that endoscopy or not? Yeah. Now, why did you choose to go the academic route versus going out to the community? So I think for me, um, research was a really important part of my career. It was something I gravitated toward pretty early. Um, Even during my residency, I became involved in some um, IBD research that I continued on through fellowship and into being an attending. Uh, um, So in terms of people that are really interested in research, you need, you know, for the most part, want to be affiliated with an academic institution. I think the other thing in terms of PDGI across the country, you know, you need uh, access to pediatric anesthesia. So that typically means you're at an academic center. Now, I I know there are examples of private practice models in other parts of the country and, you know, the Midwest or um, farther south. But in New England, 
there's actually, as far as I, there's really not much private practice in pediatric GI in this part of the country. So most of us are affiliated with an academic institution. What does call look like for you? I do about between eight to 10 weeks a year. Um, and calls really variable. Um, we have fellows at our institution. So the, the fellows take the first call from the ER or the community docs or the families. A call week can go anywhere from a couple admissions, a couple calls overnight to I've had recently a week with, you know, six or seven procedures where we do most of our procedures overnight are foreign bodies. So esophageal foreign bodies and younger kids that are symptomatic. Um, the majority of those foreign bodies are coins, but um, every now and then we have um, batteries. We have taken out a barrette. I've taken out a bay leaf. I've taken out lots of different things. Um, what about buckyballs? Uh, uh, so we, I have not personally had buckyballs, but are, we definitely have had oh. kids here that have swallowed the buckyballs and that, you know, there was a lot of legislation to try to yeah. block those. And I, I, um, cause that was a really a big, um, a really big health concern. I'm trying to think back. I haven't seen one of those in quite a while. It's good because um, of the legislation. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Well, yeah. Um, but I know over the weekend they had to come in cause, uh, a teenager swallowed about four triple A batteries. Um, mm. so, so that kept him busy. Um, so that we do, um, every now and then have acute GI bleeds. We do variceal bleeds. Um, so the call is really variable. I mean, you can go, I can have a weekend where, you know, I talk to the tele a couple of times we come in round, round on the patients in the morning, you know, get out of here by, you know, 10, 11 to a couple calls in between. And then there's other times that I essentially feel like I'm literally living here, <laughs> uh, going back and forth between procedures. I, I think that's more the exception than the rule. Um, but it, but it's kind of up and down. And for any fellow, at least here, will know that I'm usually the more exciting attending to be on call with because for some reason I just attract these things. <laughs> <laughs> You're the black cloud, huh? And I don't know why. <laughs> I, I am definitely the black cloud. Um, it's good education for the fellows. I mean, for me, I think I've probably lost more hair than I can afford because of it. But <laughs> yeah. So with uh, some good calls, some bad call, everything else going on, do you feel like you have enough time outside of the hospital for for personal life? Yeah, I think that's some, something that is an acquired skill in terms of really working on time management and trying to get as much done uh, during the time at the office as you can. I had a child a little over two years ago, and that really changed things for me. So I've tried to adjust my work schedule accordingly, which means I'm, I take on a little less things and I've learned to say no, which is also a very hard skill to learn, <laughs> um, which probably takes many, many years to to really refine and develop. But um, yeah, I think I, I think I've, you know, achieved a reasonable work-life balance. You know, it kind of ebbs and flows. So obviously, if you're on call for a week, that's your priority and you might not be home as much as you'd like to be. And, you know, you know, families understand that, hopefully. When I'm doing research, so if I'm writing a grant or I have a, a paper I'm trying to finish up, things come and you get stressed and you have to kind of bear down for a week, two weeks, you know, open your computer again, you know, stay up. You know, sometimes I work late at night because um, it's quiet and I can focus. Um, but in general, yeah, I, I think I've done a decent Decent job. I, I think again, it's 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 a skill. I think for people coming right out of fellowship, you know, adjusting at every phase of the medical career, it's a it's a hard adjustment. And you know, I've been faculty now for about eight years, so I think it's something that I've I've learned over time. And you know, you you start to realize what your priorities are, and you you make the adjustments that that are necessary. What does the training path look like to become a PDGI doc? So three years ago. General Pediatrics, and then around your second year, they actually moved it up now. Um, so around your second year, you'd apply for fellowship, and then it's three more years of uh, Pediatric GI Fellowship. And then after that, you know, nowadays some people are even doing extra years within PDGI. So there's advanced fellowships in transplant hepatology. So one of my partners, who was a fellow with us a few years ago, went and um, did an extra year of training um, at a at a liver transplant center, and is now a, um, a a pediatric um, transplant hepatologist who can care for kids with more complex liver disease who either need or have had a liver transplant. Um, there are advanced 
fellowship years in motility, where people are learning um, newer techniques and procedures to assess for dysmotility syndromes. Um, and there's actually now uh, within my field, there's even advanced years at some centers in uh, IBD, where you can do an advanced year at a, at a really uh, big IBD center. And that's something that we've thought about trying to develop in the next couple of years. But the traditional PDGI path is three years of general pediatrics and then three years of fellowship. What's the, the competitiveness of PDGI fellowships? There's not a huge number of uh, fellowships throughout the country. So I think it's generally competitive. I know when we're going through our, our interviews and in, inviting applicants to interview and then going and making our, our match list, you know, there are certain things we, we look for. So I think it's fairly competitive out of pediatrics. I don't know if it's super competitive, um, but, you know, you want to have you know, good letters of recommendation, generally good board scores. I'm not sure that needs to be a, a, a hard cutoff. I think I'd say it's generally competitive throughout pediatrics. You know, again, we aren't with talking about surgical subspecialties where, you know, obviously coming out of med school are considered to be super, super competitive. But I think within in the field of pediatrics, GI is a rather competitive subspecialty. Yeah. For the osteopathic student listening to this or osteopathic resident listening to this, what can he or she be doing to make themselves competitive? I got to say that we've, we just recently graduated a DO um, fellow who was easily one of the best fellows we ever trained. And one of the, um, one of the junior faculty that I'm working with, who's in in pediatric hematology, oncology uh, is outstanding. So, uh, you know, I think just like any traditional uh, MD student, I mean, good letters, good scores, um, work hard. I guess I'm kind of stuck in my little world here, but I don't see a huge stigma against DOs. Um, maybe as much as there used to be, I think that, you know, you, you, you take the basic substrate of your medical training from medical school and you really, you flourish and you develop your clinical skills and judgment in, in residency. And, um, I think that's what matters more than anything. Um, I, I, I don't see a huge stigma against DOs. I, I don't, other than work hard and study for your boards and like, like any other student would, I, I, I think that if you're a good, a doc, you're going to be a good doc, no matter what your uh, degrees in. What do you wish for the the future pediatricians out there? What do you wish they knew about PDGI and what you're doing day in and day out to help their patients and help you? Well, I think so. It's hard. So sometimes you wish that they were able to spend more time and just you know counsel some of the more basic stuff because some of the stuff we see probably could be managed by a general pediatrician. But I also know that. They, you know, in the primary care setting, they're seeing a lot of patients. They have to. They have to see a lot of patients to keep up with the demands, to, you know, meet RVU quotas and goals. So I think it's hard. I think our referral community is outstanding. Um, they're all really great docs. So I'm not sure if am, am I, is that answering your question. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is some of the, the more basic yeah. stuff that maybe they should be counseling on that maybe they're, they're just not comfortable counseling on? Yeah, no, I, I think the main thing is, you know, either constipation or functional abdominal pain, but sometimes it's really hard to get those messages across to the family, and that takes time, and yeah. sometimes hearing it from a subspecialist is, is important. There's also, believe it or not, there is a there is an art to treating constipation, and, um, you know, starting a med, you know, like a stool softener sometimes just isn't enough for the way you dose it or the way you use it. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance there. So, and explaining that to a family sometimes takes time. And, you know, sometimes I'll have a a 20 minute visit, but I'll end up spending 40 minutes just to really try to hammer in and give them the tools that they need to, um, to take care of those kids. Once they leave our office, we field a lot of the phone calls and help them after the visit to make sure that they're, you know, responding to the plan that we made or course adjusting as we have to. So I think it's a lot of time and energy and, and, you know, investing that time and energy early on is, is important in terms of, um, you know, keeping the kid feeling well and, and helping the the family understand the plan and really providing reassurance, but it takes time. And I think in medicine, no matter what field you are, time is a commodity, time is currency and, and it's, it's tough. Um, and you know, a lot of this stuff, you can't expect the, the general pediatrician to be able to manage all of this in a regular work day. So I, I think that's where, you know, for the non-complicated, non-sick kids, that's really where I think the subspecialties are so important. Yeah. What other specialties do you work the closest with? 
So I work really closely with uh, pediatric surgery, um, especially for my Crohn's and colitis patients. Um, we're, in a, I think our division here at Brown is, is really unique in that we have a really close relationship with um, pediatric psychology. So I work really closely with psychology, not just with patient care, but also with research. So we do a lot of research with our psychology colleagues. Um, we have weekly meetings with pathology to review the um, the slides of the patients that were scoped the week before. We have regular meetings with radiology. Oftentimes when we're rounding with the team, we'll start with started radiology and review any imaging of uh, patients that are in the hospital. Um, we work really closely with our hospitalist colleagues, obviously. We, we do a lot of consults with them, which is a lot of fun, actually. I, I really enjoy working with the hospitalists here. I think those are the the big ones, but um, for Crohn's, I, I work closely with, with dermatology, um, neurology. It hits the big ones, but it really depends on the patient. Yeah. What opportunities are there outside of clinical medicine for PDGI docs? So there's a lot of opportunity in uh, pharma. Mm -hmm. So I know a few people that um, practiced for a few years and then ended up going to work at various pharmaceutical companies. And jobs within pharma are, are pretty diverse. So you can do work on designing clinical trials. You can work on drug design. It really depends on what your background is um, and what your interests are. Um, I think that that's something, at least in my experience, that more people are are gravitating toward. Um, I think in some ways, especially in the in the world of inflammatory bowel disease, there's so many new drugs in development um, and in various phases of being studied or trialed that there's a lot of need within the bigger pharma companies to have um, input from physicians with clinical experience treating these diseases. Mm -hmm. So um, I do know quite a few people that have decided to either leave clinical medicine full-time and take these a position or take, take a position and still, you know, come in work, you know, maybe once a month or cover a call a couple of times a, a year to, to kind of maintain some clinical experience or exposure. But I think the big one would be working for pharma. Yeah. If you could yeah. go back and talk to yourself before you went into PDGI uh, with everything that you know now, what would you tell yourself? You'd probably tell myself, try not to be too distracted by the salary discrepancies within different fields of medicine. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it's hard because, you know, at the end of the day, you got to pick something you love. And yeah. if you're not doing something you really love, no matter how much money you make, if, if, if you have to come to work every day and it's a struggle or you don't like it, it's probably, it's not, you're not going to be happy. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of trite, but my money isn't everything and money doesn't buy happiness. And, you know, so, you know, obviously there are certain fields or, you know, you'll know somebody that went to med school is making five times your salary and you're like, you know, what the heck? <laughs> um, yep. and, you know, not working as much, but, you know, so I really would like to think if I went back knowing what I, I know, I would still choose this field because it's, it's something I enjoy. You know, I love my patients. I love the families. I love the science. I love the research. I love the procedures. And I think for me, there's very few fields that, you know, offer me that. So, and I, I love working with kids. And so, you know, in general, if you, I'm sure nowadays people know if they're choosing pediatrics as a subspecialty, they're not choosing it because they want to make a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you get the PD discount. Yeah. If I went back in time, I might, you know, give myself some advice on, you know, how to frame this grant or that grant or do this differently or that differently. But in general, I, I, I would like to think that I would mentor myself like I mentor my, you know, resident and fellow mentees and just, you know, encourage them and tell them to, you know, pick something they love to do. What do you like the most about being a PDGI? Developing the relationships with my patients and families can be very rewarding. I've been doing this now, you know, and I, I stayed at the same institution for residency and fellowship. So I've been here for I don't know, 14 years or something. And, you know, I've seen kids from being super small to graduating high school and, you know, seeing that appreciation from the families and, you know, you know, getting a hug from a kid, you know, it's just, it's, it's everything. And it's, it's really, it's really rewarding. And I think the relationships, you know, not just with patients, but also with colleagues and with support staff, it's a great feeling knowing that you've made a difference and knowing that people really value you for what you do. 
What do you like the least? Uh, uh, God, can I the list? Um, <laughs> EMR. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the top of the list. Is a challenge. I, I yeah, I'm get, I'm guessing that I, I'm not the first one to answer that. Yeah. I think the the business side of medicine is necessary, but it can be ugly. And you know, being told you need to see more patients, you need to scope more patients. You know, which doesn't happen. You know, obviously in kids, but there's always this kind of sense that you know you need to bring more money. And you need to do more. You need to do more. Um, and you know that's that's tough. I think that you know in general, I'm lucky to be part of a department and division that's really supportive, and I, I think you know truly cares about child health and and whatnot. But you know, every month you get your productivity reports, and you're compared to everybody else, and you see how many patients you saw, how many procedures you did, how much money you brought in, and you know that's again, it's necessary, but it's not why most people go into medicine and sometimes you kind of see that and it, it, it's a little you just i don't want to look at it <laughs> yeah and then the documenting you know you see a patient and you know for the amount of time you spend in the room you've got to spend almost as you know as much time you know doing your emr finishing your notes going through your messages people that out there listening that have epic you know managing it in basket is a unpleasant task but it's necessary so i think those are the big things that i don't like being on call and you know being up all night sometimes and then going to work the next day it's not the most enjoyable thing but it's few and far between and if you're up all night it's for a reason you're 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 helping somebody you're helping a kid you're helping a family so you can get through that that's okay um the other stuff is kind of just more annoying and a, and a burden yeah any last words of wisdom for the medical student or the resident who is interested in PDGA? Work hard. I think find a good mentor. Um, for me, um, having good mentors throughout the way has been so important. I've been really lucky to have great mentorship here, uh, mentorship at other institutions. So I think, you know, having somebody to help guide you no matter what phase of your career you're in is, is really important. Um, so I would say, Find somebody that you trust and that seems to truly care about you and your career and latch on to them. Doesn't need to be in your subspecialty. I mean, I've had mentors outside pediatrics. I've had mentors outside GI. But I think having a, a good mentor is important at all stages of your career, especially early on, to help guide you through some of that, the nitty gritty stuff. And then I'd say work hard, be honest. Always treat everybody with kindness, whether it's your colleagues, your people that are junior to you, people that are senior to you, your nurses, your secretaries, treat everybody with kindness. You know, everybody's there to do a job and you can't do your job if other people aren't doing theirs. So, I mean, you know, it's you're part of a, a team and it's important to understand that and, and live every day realizing that. All right, there you have it, PDGI for you. Very interesting specialty, lots of fun stuff, uh, lots of great information from Dr. Shapiro today. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Uh, I, I do want to point out something that he talked about and, and something that I bring up a bunch on my pre-med years podcast. And if you're a medical student listening to this, um, not necessarily information for you, but for the pre-med world, there's, there's a lot of discussion out there. And there was a... Uh, a big YouTube channel that posted kind of a, a DOMD type discussion recently. And the discussion was all around how DOs are not respected. And it's just, it's not true. Um, are there some programs out there? Are there some people out there who, who disrespect DO? Sure. But there's lots of disrespect in general in the world. Uh, and it's not a, a broad painted kind of idea that if you are DO, you are lesser than. So Dr. Shapiro talking about a DO graduating from Brown, a DO attending there at Brown, big allopathic medical center. So um, if you are a DO interested in PDGI, there is hope for you. Um, just to go out and do your best. That's, that's who matches into these residencies and into these fellowships are individual people, not individual MDs or DOs. So go check it out. Uh, if you are interested in PDGI, and I hope you have a great week. We'll be back next week with another great guest, this time talking about anatomic and clinical pathology. This 
This is MedEd Media.